Welcome to Unlocking the Hidden Value of Your Life Insurance with Mark Murky and Rob Haney from Life Insurance Settlements. This show is designed to help retirees and their advisors understand the basics of a life settlement. In this podcast, we show you how to get more from the sale of your life insurance policy versus lapse or surrender, and how using life settlements can increase assets under management. Mark and Rob ignite conversations on how to look for opportunities and navigate the life settlement process so you and your clients can enjoy a comfortable retirement. Now on to the show. Hello, and welcome to the Life Settlements Podcast with your host, Rob Haney and Mark Markey. Guys, good to be with you again. Every one of these podcasts is an eye-opening piece of education for me, and I am sure for a lot of your listeners. Good to see you again. Good to see you, Bill, Rob, Jose. Hey, guys. Good to see you, guys. So what do we have on tap today? So uh, I'll I'll lead off uh, on on with us today uh, all the way across the pond is Jose Garcia, who's the chief executive officer of Carlisle Management, which is a purchaser of life settlement policies, and uh, Jose's been doing that for quite some time. I'm not going to get into <clears throat> all the things that Jose's done. I'll let him kind of elaborate on that a little bit because I want to save time. It take us about forty minutes to do that. Uh, but uh, what's interesting about uh, Mr. Garcia and and myself and our relationship is we met each other about 20 years ago when he was uh, just getting into the business, in my opinion, uh, and really running a life settlement provider. Uh, and and after a while, Jose said some things to me, and I've always kind of took them very serious because each and everything he said was going to happen did. Uh, one of the most interesting things he said to me one time was – that he was interested in uh, seeing this market grow and how it would grow as the life expectancies that they were purchasing would get longer and longer. And the funds would come to the realization they could buy a, this asset and hold it for a much longer period of time. And again, I'll let Jose get, get into that, but that is in fact happened as well. So uh, without further ado, I'll let Mark Murky tell us a little bit about what he's got planned. Yeah. Um, so, you know, everyone to, to kind of head in a direction we want to take on this podcast. So when you, you know, the life settlement industry is vast, you've got different players in this industry. And one, one question I get a lot on phone with consumers and advisors and financial planners is, Hey, I, I see these commercials on TV telling me I can sell my policy. Am I selling it to those groups on the commercial? And I say, well, yes or no, those are the licensed providers, but each of those providers they have underlying funds that they go to who are raising capital to actually be the main or the purchaser of your client's policy. And that's Jose's function. He represents institutional investors. I'll let him get into this, that he channels his money through these licensed providers. So last night, you know, it was funny. I was thinking about the podcast and I got a call from an advisor and he says, you know, I have a client. He wants to sell his policy. He's seen the commercials, but he wants to know who's really buying my policy and how do they track my policy? Meaning, how do they know when I pass away? And how involved is it once I sell my policy to one of these underlying funds? So that's why we've brought Jose in. He's one of many underlying funds, hedge funds, pension funds, institutional investment capital that's raising money so that they can buy policies from the likes of the providers that you may or may not see on television. So Jose, tell us, you know, tell us just a little bit more about your fund, how you raise money. I mentioned, how do you track people once you know that you've bought in a policy, how you warehouse that policy, and a little bit that goes on behind the scenes when you're purchasing these policies. Sure. Let's get, let's get right to it. Thank you guys. First, for, first of all, for having me on the, on the podcast. Uh, it's a, it's an honor to be here. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's important. I mean, I think I'll, there's a lot of questions on both sides. Also from when I, when I speak to investors, they always ask me, uh, well, how do I know that the person uh, behind the policy is a real person? Who who is that person? How do I, uh, you know, track uh, the life? How do I make sure that I get my money when that person dies? So uh, these questions happen in both sides of the equation, not just on the person selling the policy. Um, while one person has the responsibility uh, to sell the policy and is obviously concerned uh, for the remainder of you know the quality of life or whatever, the other person has to provide a certain amount of capital 
to buy that policy and is obviously concerned about that capital as well is it is it is it placed well so uh, in order to to in order to address both the consumer who's selling the policy and the investor who is actually uh, investing money in one of these funds to buy a policy the life settlement industry has kind of developed a a, a fairly uh, robust framework uh, from one side, and I'm not going to get into the the sellers of the policy because that's what you guys are are best uh, best at to explain. Is you know you have financial advisors, you have uh, insurance agents, and you also have a life a licensed life settlement broker who represents the seller in the transaction. From our side, as an investment manager, our job is to raise capital, uh, usually in the form of a fund, whether it's a mutual fund or a private equity fund, where we go out and visit with a number of investors. Most of our investors are what we call institutional investors. That's usually comp comprised of pension funds, university endowments, family offices, sovereign funds, and other large-scale investors. We're talking about investors that are making large allocations and not small investors, but investors that are making investments of millions and millions of dollars, okay? All of that money is then collected into a fund uh, that we manage, Carla Management would manage, and then... We then contract with life settlement providers, which is uh, which is the 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 opposite, uh, also the the reciprocal of a life settlement broker on the buy side. So a, a licensed life settlement provider is a regulated entity, usually licensed in the state that it's doing businesses or in a number of states, and they represent us, the buyer of the transaction. So to answer your question, Mark, when when someone buys your client's policy. First, it is usually the provider. The provider is the regulated entity uh, that that we need to use uh, in order to abide by life settlement regulation. They represent us, the buyer, okay? And the buyer is usually a mutual fund or a private equity fund uh, that collects money from institutional investors. When the policy is purchased, in other words, when the ownership transfers uh, to to the buyer, to us, it doesn't transfer directly to us, but it transfers to a securities intermediary or to a, a custodian bank, the largest one being Wells Fargo. So you basically will have a, a financial institution, whether it's a bank or a large institution that owns these policies uh, on behalf of our funds. And they are responsible for the, the clean title of the policies, but also for the ongoing administration of of set policy, so uh, the life settlement industry, I think today is, is is very institutional. Most of the transactions that that we are familiar with are occurring with large financial institutions that are holding these assets on behalf of investors uh, in order to ensure a you know a, a regulatory compliance uh, to the life settlement uh, uh, laws and regulations, as well as an institutional experience for both sellers and investors. Um, you know, and then just kind of like to to add to your to your last uh, to your last question is, you know, how involved is it once uh, you know if my dad is actually now in his late seventies and he's looking to sell some of his policies and you know he's asked me all these questions as well and you know we've been doing this long enough that we've been asked this question once or twice and I think it's important for your clients to know is that when you sell your policy, um, you are entering into an agreement, okay. Uh, you are providing, you know, you're being paid a substantial amount of money for an asset that would otherwise have no, li no, no, no liquidity, no liquid market. Okay, um, and we're not asking you uh, to do a lot. All we're asking is, is that you know, if if we're going to pay you a lot of money for your policy, you have to at least. Uh, commit yourself to being tracked okay we will try to make that as uh less invasive as possible we're not going to call you every day we're not going to uh you know we're not going to call you every month we're going to appoint a servicing company a servicing company is a third-party professional company who specializes and is fully regulated and licensed to do tracking uh you're going to uh you know have a conversation with them and commit to a form of of contact, okay? Whether that is through a phone call, whether that is through a letter, whether that is through a family contact, an attorney or a family member, uh, something that works for you, okay? Uh, and, and then from that point forward, that's all we ask for is for you to keep in touch with us provide us information, uh, and we will do the rest. And our servicing companies will continue doing the rest. A lot of the tracking today is done electronically, social security uh, computers. Um, but it is important to know that the sellers have to abide by the contract. And the contract is, we're going to buy your policy for a lot of money, 
but then you must commit to to staying in touch with us because just like you want to collect your money when we buy the policy, our investors want to collect their money when it's time for them to. So you you touched on some great things there. I appreciate that. And and one of the things you said in the end, um, how do you know when a client does pass away? Obviously, you're not contacting clients on a monthly basis, a weekly basis, probably once a year at most. That's what I hear from most providers. Also, what I hear from most clients that, hey, I might have gotten contacted one time since I sold my policy a year at most. But how do you know when a client actually passes away? I think you mentioned social security databases. Is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, there's a num- there's a number of factors. Um, you know, probably the three most proficient ways for us to know is first, uh, there are electronic services that we um, that we um, uh, that we that are servicing companies that we appoint uh, have access to. These usually have to do with social security, obituary of databases, uh, a number of other factors. Obviously, when when our servicing company when we buy a policy, and our servicing company will have access to the person's data. Social security number, address, you know, things like that. Uh, we'll go to through a database, and that you know, we'll get notifications from the database if there is a match. Okay, sure. That's that's usually the first way. The second way, uh, which is usually also a very very proficient way, which happens a lot, which is like a family member will contact us. You know, when um, when a person passes on, there's usually some kind of an executor of the will. You know, whether it's a child or a trustee or or a third party that basically is responsible for uh, notifying uh, death. You know, notifying find death and, and helping us file a, uh, a paperwork. Um, more often than not, the life, a, a, an insured had more than one life insurance policies, you know? Uh, so there's a lot of collaboration we can do with the family estate. You know, we could actually, you know, collect uh, death certificates together. We can file claim forms together. Sometimes you uh, life insurance companies only require one form to be filed uh, or, you know, uh, and, and they will pay out on multiple policies. So we can definitely also even be helpful to the state. Uh, to the family, uh, to uh, uh, to the insured's family, by 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 assisting with those kind of administrative duties, and then last but not least, usually what will happen is if there's a former contact that we have agreed upon, whether it's a phone call or a third party contact, and we we simply cannot get a hold of the insured, we cannot get a hold of the contact, and there's no feedback, then we'll have to do a little digging. We'll have to find. We'll have to maybe make some phone calls. We'll have to try to you know get more information. Maybe contact uh, doctors uh, in order to do that. But that would be kind of like the last case scenario if the first two uh, are not uh, are not uh, are not uh, effective yeah great that's uh you backed up my answer to the call last night from my advisor that's <laughs> been doing this 23 years and i'm like still okay yeah this is the answer let's make sure i'm given the correct one which is what you just said and i'll back up even more to to when we we started this question about who's buying my policies my answer is always the same to financial advisors and consumers i say these are sophisticated institutional capital sources this isn't and i get this call a lot still our industry's 30 years old but there's still this apprehension, this fear that, hey, if I sell my policy, I'm selling it to Joey Bag of Donuts who wants me to die tomorrow, not 10 years from tomorrow. And I have to tell people that, no, that's not the life settlement industry. It is a group of sophisticated investors. They warehouse these policies. And you touched on this, Jose. So I, I'm glad you you kind of brought up all of this uh underlying fund information that we do. We still get this a lot because you're talking to clients that are in their 70s or in their 80s. They have family members. And this, these 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 questions get brought to us a lot that, boy, yeah, I, I've heard this life settlement. Sounds like a great idea. But boy, who am I really selling to and what goes in? What's involved in that sale? So I think you touched on all these things. Uh, I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, I, th- I think it's important just to re- reiterate that, you know, this is a sophisticated product for sophisticated investors. We don't work with retail clients. Like if somebody comes off the street and says, I'd like to invest 100000 that the answer is no, we don't deal with those kind of clients. We deal only with institutions uh, that are making multi-million dollar allocations. They're sophisticated. Uh, and, you know, all of the investment vehicles are usually regulated. They've got, you know, big four uh, auditing firms like KPMG or Deloitte actually doing work and reviewing all of the procedures. Uh, and everything's done through third-party marketers, uh, sorry, third-party service, servicers um, that can actually, that are actually licensed. And I think it's important for uh, sellers to know that the industry today, you know, and you said 30 years old, we've, we've evolved a lot in 30 years. It's very regulated. You've got you know, transactional standards. You've got regulation in most states uh, by the insurance commissions. You got you know licensing requirements for brokers, licensing requirements for 
for providers. Uh, in some states, you even have bonding requirements for these providers. I think these are all things that are aimed to making the transaction more safe and easier for the consumer. They're definitely not not made, you know, to they're not made to, um, you know, to 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 make the transaction more easier to get to. It actually makes the transaction more complex. But I think the idea is to protect both the seller and the investor who's buying the policy. Has there and Rob, you have an answer, and then I'll let you. I'll shut up for a little while. Has there ever been an incident of wrongdoing in the life settlement industry when a purchaser purchased a policy and then mysteriously a client passed away early? Rob, not to my knowledge. Exactly, and I and I tell people that all the time. And you got to look at this transaction that if a institution's buying your policy and your family member somehow dies early, the first area they're going to look at is who owns the insurance policy, and there's never been an instance of wrongdoing in the life settlement industry. And it's important to let our viewers, our podcast listeners know that. And I don't believe there ever will be. Um, does that purchaser have an interest in your death? Yes. Do they think, hope maybe that you die early? Mm, I don't know, maybe similar to an annuity, I guess. I've used that analogy before. When you buy a single premium annuity, that annuity carrier, they hope you die earlier and sooner. Well, same thing exists in our industry, but it, it's not, there's never been an instance of foul play. So it's always por- important for our uh, our listeners to know that, to understand that. Yeah. L- law of large numbers. I've been on panels before where um, uh, people involved with the carrier, whether it be the CEO on down to vice presidents have intimated that, oh, this could happen, this could happen, this could happen. And in raw reality, the foul play that's ever occurred in the in the life insurance industry has been by a, a close family member, um, and, and and that's well documented. But as, as we get to this asset, as Jose mentioned in his in his uh, introduction, uh, this is sophisticated investor. So that leads me to my next question. So two two parter, Jose. Uh, one, tell us when it was you felt the industry was going to grow and by grow i mean start to buy longer life expectancies and then second uh part to that is i have the privilege and honor to go to your uh event in geneva i missed it last year but i've been several times and i've seen these individuals representing the sophisticated capital com tell us why they like to buy this asset um, versus, say, other assets. You no know, people will talk about it being uncorrelated. But tell us, you know, what, in your daily conversations, how that works. So one, wh- when did you see this going? Because you did, you told me it was going to go longer. And secondly, how has that affected your ability to raise capital, certainly in a positive way? Well, th- that's, you know, that's a, that's going to be a long answer, but uh, let's break it up into sections. Um, so, so you you know that's your first question. How did I know it was going to be longer? Um, I, I think it's quite quite normal. I mean, I think if you look at if you look at the industry from two sides, first a, a financial market, a new financial market. Um, you know, there's not a lot of new financial markets. Most of the markets we see today are derivatives of previous financial markets. I think the life settlement market, while it can be considered a derivative of life insurance, it really was a new financial market. And whenever you have um, whenever you have a new market, it's quite normal that people don't want to make long commitments. You know, um, the same thing as you know, you wouldn't you wouldn't marry your wife on the first date. You know, you try to go on a few dates first, and if it works, then maybe you take it to the next level, right? Well, the same thing with any investment product, right? When you have a new product with no track record, no history, it's only normal that the only available capital that you have is short, a short term capital. Um, but indubitably, that's that's a very temporary, um, you know, uh, effect. Eventually, people are looking. If especially if it's working, people are looking to deploy capital for more capital for longer periods of time. So that's that's kind of on one side. From the other side, let's look at the the underwriting. So, you know, when you invest in sh- in, in short term life settlements, or as they used to be known, viatical settlements, predominantly you're looking for people that are going to die very soon. You know, and when I say very soon, it's say, you know, two, three, four years max. This is a very small percentage of the population. Most of the people that are going to be dying in the next, you know, two to three to four years are very sick, uh, whether they're terminal or they have some very large uh, impairment or they're very, 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 very old in their mid or late 90s, you know? Um, this is a very, very niche area. Most most of the underwriting around this area 
was more medical underwriting, as I would call it, rather than mortality underwriting, where people were looking more at medical records, so looking at more underlying, you know, comorbidities and impairments and cancers and effects of, of you know, secondary diseases. It's a very specialized, very medically driven uh, sector, which personally, I think is also very flawed. Uh, I think that, you know, I mean, how many how many of us know um, you know, people that have survived cancer. I mean, I have several in my family and, 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 you know, acquaintances, it's not longer a death sentence like it was say 30 years ago or 20 years ago. So medical breakthroughs do affect a lot that, that market. And I just knew, I mean, when you and I were talking, Rob, I knew that eventually people were going to say, listen, we need to, you know, if we're going to continue investing in life settlements, we need to have an institutional quantitative approach to this, not such a medical opinion type of approach. So I knew that if institutional capital was going to get really serious about deploying large amounts of capital, we needed to do two things. First is we needed to provide them a bigger market. Obviously, if you go out with a longer life expectancy, your market gets exponentially bigger. There are many more people that may qualify for our life settlements. If you say you move your life expectancy to 10, or 12 years, for example. And second, we need to provide this institutional capital with a quantitative model that can be backtested, where we can actually provide data based on uh, on uh, on uh, you know on actual mortality tables, on life insurance data that's readily available, publicly available even. And the only way to do that is to make the process less medically driven and more quantitative driven. Um, and that's, I don't know if you remember many years ago, I think it's over 20 years ago now that we started working with... Uh, the guys at Germany at IFA, uh, they were doing the first probabilistic valuation model. And I think that's when the industry sort of flipped. The industry said, okay, let's focus less on, you know, Mr. Joe Blow, you know, 78 years old, who, you know, who has a ton of impairments. And let's just say, look, you know, uh, Mr. John Smith over here has, you know, is 82 years old, is in relatively good health, but, you know, he may even qualify for new life insurance coverage, but he may also qualify for a life settlement on his existing coverage, you know, and try to apply the same um, the same tools and the same models and the same underwriting guidelines that life insurance companies have been using successfully for many, many years. So I, I think that once we were able to provide institutional capital with uh, that foundation, a quantitative foundation, a model data that they could then give their analyst department and they could backtest, that they could stress, that they could, uh, you know, that they, that they, they knew was coming from a much bigger world of life insurance. I think that capital became more comfortable with life settlements. And this, that's when the, you know, sort of money just started coming in. And I think now we're about 20 years ago, I think it was about 2003, 2004, when we started seeing vast amounts of institutional capital coming into our asset class. Uh, and I think that was kind of the breaking point is let's, let's focus less on the medical opinion and let's focus more on the foundation of life insurance, which is quantitative approach. Perfect. So the second part was when you talk to your investors, I have overheard this, but let me see how you say it. What are some of the reasons they're they're very happy and uh, and continue to invest in this asset class? What is, well, what is it about a settlement? I mean, I think that um, you know, I think that once one one has to look at first of all, life insurance. Life insurance is one of the oldest markets in the world. It's been around for hundreds of years. Uh, life insurance companies also boast some of the, the world's strongest balance sheets and strongest track record, track, uh, you know, uh, track records. Um, I think that anybody that looks at life insurance looks at, you know, thinks about a very, very strong and robust industry. So I think that, like, you know, investors are looking at life settlements as a derivative of life insurance. You know, the guarantors of the of this of these contracts are the life insurance companies. I know I'm going to get paid if Transamerica, if John Hancock, if Lincoln, uh, if AXA are the guarantors or the creditors of these contracts. So I think the first the first point is the credit quality of life settlements is very attractive to many investors. And, and second of all, and you know, I don't want to go into a tangent about you mentioned before the lower large numbers, you know, the fact that we're building large diversified portfolio with hundreds of thousands of lives in these portfolios where um, you know, we're mimicking some of the balance sheets from those life insurance carriers and where the performance driver is death. In other words, we get paid when someone dies. Uh, I think it's, you know, you can make the very, very strong case that this asset class is uncorrelated to traditional financial markets. Um, we don't particularly care who is the president you know, Biden or Trump or what the Federal Reserve is doing this week or what, you know, 
Venezuela is doing to oil prices or, you know, unfortunately, you know, Iran and, 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 and Israel duking it out. For us, these are all irrelevant. They're, they do not affect our investment performance. And I think that is one of the biggest attributes of life settlements is that investors can rest assured that their investment performance is minimally, you can never say completely, but let's just yep. say minimally correlated uh, to, 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 you know, to geopolitical events, to economic indicators, uh, and any other financial markets. And I think these are the two factors why uh, why investors are very attractive to life settlements, as well as a track record. Uh, and then just kind of to, to to finish off the answer with, you know, what you brought up before, which is the Geneva Conference. We've been, you know, doing our Geneva Conference for 15 years in a row. Uh, we have had, um, you know, a number of very, very uh, marquee, very large institutional investors from, you know, global pension funds to global investment banks. Uh, we've had the pleasure of having speakers uh, that include a number of, of very, very talented and very sophisticated uh, professionals from Wall Street all the way to Hong Kong, um, you know, speaking about life settlements, about capital markets within life settlements. Uh, and I think that, you know, it, you know, you, Rob, you've been there. It really shows that the the capital behind the industry is extremely sophist uh, sophisticated capital, uh, extremely smart capital uh, looking for alternative assets. And that's why I think life settlements has been very, has been very successful over the years. Perfect. Since we're Thank talking you, capital, um, you've been doing your Geneva conference for 15 years. You've seen capital come in for the last 15 years and even prior to that. Fast forward 5, 10, 15 years from now, where or what do you see the capital in our industry doing? Do you see it continuing to grow? Because without guys like you, guys like us don't exist. If we don't have people like you to sell policies to, mm -hmm. we don't have a job. So where do you see the market potential for the money that you're raising going? Fast forwarding 10, 20 years from now. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, like any financial market, capital, uh, capital cyclical, right? You know, you go through cycles of of more capital and then cycles of less capital. Um, you know, in 2008, the whole world kind of saw a, a contraction of capital available. Then we had a very, very rapid growth period where capital grew very, very, very uh, fast. Uh, and the life settlement industry has another element to it. It's not just capital. It's also the availability of policies, you know? Um, you know, in 2020, during COVID, we saw uh, a very, very large contraction of offers, you know, of basically of policies on offer of policies for sale. I think obviously because of COVID and, and mortality issues, a lot of people had a you know, second thoughts about selling the life insurance policies. I think it's it's quite common. So the industry went through a bit of a contraction. Uh, in other words, transactions went down, um, and then capital, you know, sort of found homes elsewhere. What we've seen over the last twelve months is we've seen sort of a research of policies. We've seen more policies for sale than we're seeing capital kind of come back to the industry. So um, we see a growth pattern again, Mark, uh, but I, I, you know, since this podcast is mostly uh, geared towards the supply side of the business, sellers, you know, um, I think it's important to know that the capital will be there so long as people are willing to sell their life insurance policies. I think that's, that's, that's key. Uh, nobody wants to chase a, a difficult market where they're competing against other capital for a few policies. So I think that's important. I, I think now we're seeing, um, we're seeing interesting innovations in the asset class. Um, very much like the the mortgage industry, you know, mortgage, you know, mortgage, the, the mortgage companies were lending, 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 but at some point they had to find avenues to unload their their product so they can keep lending, right? So I think life settlements is the same. I mean, we keep raising capital, we keep buying more policy, but if the industry continues to grow exponentially, we're probably, you know, we're starting to see things like securitizations where we can securitize assets or we can resell, we can resell policies to other investors that are not necessarily um, primary players in the asset class. Um, and, you know, now you have, you know, not to mention, you know, not to mention uh, other companies in the industry, but you have companies like Avacus who have gone public uh, and found new ways to capitalize their their programs, which I think is very exciting as well. So uh, I think that, that you know, the industry is, go is poised for a lot of growth. Uh, and I think that the increase in policies and policies for sale will definitely help fuel that. And I think our ability to unload or to resell blocks of policies to third parties, whether it's uh, uh, through securitizations, you know, uh, permanent capital vehicles, or uh, simply to other investors not looking to come in and deal directly with the, with the sellers or the consumers, I think will only help us to increase what we call the velocity of money and in ultimately increase the demand for life settlements.
You just touched on something. I want to I want to let the listeners know. Um, you touched on resale. Um, you buy a policy, Jose. Uh, typically, a group like yours maybe has a buy and hold strategy, but you also have the ability to go out and resell a portfolio of policies, much like a uh, the mortgage industry does. You sell bank loans to this bank and that bank and the other. Tell us more about how that happens in the life settlement industry, where if someone buys, sells their policy to XYZ company, that it is a possibility that five years down the road, it may be resold to another group like you or you selling it to another group. Yeah, absolutely. So, so that's, I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons why we usually work with life settlement providers. Uh, when you buy, when you enter into an agreement with a life settlement provider, a provider is the licensed entity representing the buyer in the transaction, but that, that, that provider can work with multiple funding sources. So the agreements that you sign can be assigned to another party, very much like a loan. When you get a, when you go out and get a mortgage, you usually sign a form that's that you are basically allowing for the mortgage to be transferred to a third party or to another intermediary. Uh, the same thing with life settlements. So what we do is, you know, we buy policies, you know, many times one at a time directly from sellers and and you know from companies such as LIS, a life settlement broker, uh, and then we 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 basically build these large portfolios. As these portfolios get built, uh, we may need to sell some of the exposure. We may have uh, maybe bought too much of a life insurance company, or we may be you know, under-diversified and need to redeploy some of the capital. Or hey, we may just need some liquidity because we we spent too you know we bought too much and we need to we need to unwind some of it so that we can continue purchasing. So there's a number of factors why we may want to sell assets. Uh, so what we do is basically we then shop those assets to other institutions, usually uh, you know very large pension funds, investment banks, private equity shops. Uh, and what we do is we sell blocks. So we you know it's very unlikely that we would sell one policy, but we would sell maybe like 20, 30, 50, 100 policies. Uh, and that's done on a block basis. In other words, the insurer doesn't have to sign any new documentation. You've already signed the contracts. Basically, we're, all we're doing is assigning the existing contracts to another party. Uh, it is always going to be covered by an institutional counterparty. There's always going to be a custody bank or, or security intermediary like Wells Fargo uh, in, in the transaction in order to secure the, 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 the transaction. Uh, you simply may just get a letter from a different servicer saying uh, your policy has has been resold. Uh, we are now going to be responsible for the servicing agreement. Uh, therefore, you no longer need to contact company X. From here forward, we just contact us, company Y, and that's it. Very much like you know, and and you know, in the insurance world, if you ever have a life insurance comp- uh, policy, you know, from a company that's been sold, you know, I mean, we 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 you know, in our thirty years in the business, we've done that many many times. Um, you know, often you'll get a letter saying your policy has been sold, your policy will no longer be serviced by this company. You now will be serviced by that company. Uh, from from the seller's point of view, it's going to be very much the same. Great, great answer. We get that question um, from previous sellers for sure. So yeah, Rob. So we'll kind of touch a little bit on what Jose said earlier too about uh, there'll always be capital as long as there's our policies to sell. So Mark and I beat our brains out every day to try and educate the consumer about this option, to educate a licensed life insurance producer, et cetera. Uh, On Friday, I'll make a little news here. There's an NQL meeting in Nashville. Lisa's executive director, along with uh, Alan Berger, spoke before the for the group and proposed in front of the ACLI, I'll add, that um, they speed up the interactions with us for collecting information, illustrations, et cetera, put a 21-day time limit on that, to which the ACLI had no problem with. And then Alan went, the second was the information relayed to the consumer by the producer, he wanted to prohibit restrictions from carriers telling their producers they couldn't talk about it, to which the ACLI objected. Uh, But in that, you know, the point was made that consumers each and every day have a life insurance policy that they don't want, need, or can't afford, and are going to their their life insurance producer or their, if they will, expert on the topic – and he or she may be prohibited from talking about it. So that's what we face every day, uh, at least on that front. So you, you mentioned Abacus, and I just mentioned Alan, so Coventry, the two commercials that run nonstop. That's kind of helped our marketplace. What do you see uh, from your perspective, and what would you suggest we do 
from your perspective, because I value your opinion. I kind of think you're kind of like a, a omnipresent. You're kind of living 10 years ahead of time while you're sitting here in 2024. So what what can we be doing a better job of to get you more policies so you can purchase them? Well, I think I think I think the two companies you named are just doing a great job. I mean, I you know I I can't you know every time I I giggle every time I go to the U.S. and I sit in my hotel on in the evening and I'm working and I see you know Jay Jackson's face on the on the screen you know or, or the Coventry logo. I think it I think it's great. I mean, I think that if I recall correctly, and I could be wrong, um, it was it Lifeline many years ago did a. Uh, a survey where they called, I don't know how many thousands of seniors and, you know, it's something like 76% of seniors have never heard of a life settlement. They didn't know what a life settlement was. These are people that own life insurance policies. And I think that was always the biggest issue in our market was, was consumer ignorance. Uh, and I don't mean that in a negative way that, you know, that yeah. they are ignorant people. I mean that they, the, the market has not provided enough education and they remain somewhat subdued in their knowledge of life settlements. And you're right. The carriers have not really helped. Uh, the carriers have been, you know, sort of a, a, a you know, a, a, um, a driving force against us. But I think that's also changing now. I think that, I don't know if you saw recently, there was a, a an article about, you know, some of the carriers actually buying policies directly back from the market, you know? Uh, so it's starting to happen now. Carriers are realizing that we're here to stay. There's enough capital. I mean, you can't, you know, if you've got some huge marquee names making large investments in life settlements, you cannot deny that there's smart capital in this asset class. And I think that carriers need to sort of get get with the game and realize that maybe, just maybe, if life settlements was to succeed and provide liquidity to the asset class, they may actually sell more insurance, you know? Uh, yeah. And I think that that's, that's the issue. The issue is that, you know, when you buy life insurance, I mean, I remember when I was, you know, in my in my early 30s and I bought my first life insurance policy because, you know, I I bought a home and I was a responsible guy and I had a baby on the way, you know, uh, I recognized that it was a li- liquid asset and that was one driving force of why I didn't buy more insurance because I knew that, you know, I was never, ho- I was hoping never to die. Uh, so I knew that I, I wouldn't collect on it. But, you know, what if we can actually bring some confidence to the market that, a life insurance can have a uh, monetization value in the future above and beyond the surrender value, I think it would actually, you know, cause people to buy more life insurance policy and be more comfortable with the investment into life insurance policy. Um, and and I think that if, uh, if advisors were better versed, if life insurance companies and national organizations wouldn't be so uh, objecting to 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 them speaking about life settlements, I think that they wouldn't. You know, I think people still do it, but they do it kind of behind you know the scenes. They you know hush hush, and I think that causes even more problems. Let's put it on the table. Let's educate them how to do it right, how to do it compliantly, how to do it the right you know the right way you know, and and, and helping to you know to 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 battle that that consumer ignorance that we're currently seeing. So I think all of these are great things. I think that carriers coming around and large companies making large, you know, marketing investments on television ads are definitely going to help us. And I think that the reason why you know uh, we went through a period of of sort of con- contraction was because um, you know, large institutions were unlikely to sell their life insurance portfolios because they, they they felt that they couldn't replace them from consumers directly. I think that's changing now. And I think that mo- the more the secondary market, the more the direct consumer market, um, you know, comes about, I think the the the, the more uh, institutional capital is going to be confident to keep making investments into this asset class. Perfect. Do you Thank see you. your side of the industry, you just touched on our job. You know, Rob did. You know, we this is our job to educate financial advisors. Uh, you see the television commercials, the providers educating the consumers. Do you see your side of the uh, equation, the underlying capital, the sophisticated investment capital, hedge funds, pension funds? Do you see them jumping into this pool and helping educate so they can get more policies from guys like us? Um. You know, I, I'll 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 tell you a little bit about some of our struggles. So, um, and this is something that I've discussed with you, Rob, and I'd like to discuss at the next Lisa meeting. Um, is is data right? So most of my investors, Mark, they don't they don't want to face the consumer 
You know, they are institutional capital, you know, just like they don't want to be the ones facing the more, you know, the, the person taking out the mortgage or, you know, dealing directly with the home. They they are, they they want to be removed. They want to, you know, they're making a hundred million dollar investments, you know, over thousands of lives, you know, they're not, they don't want to be part of the consumer transaction, which is why they hire guys like me and guys like Wells Fargo and providers in order to create an institutional experience. The biggest issue that we have is the lack of data. Life settlements, I mean, if you go to like, if you go to like um, fixed income or the stock market or futures or commodities, you have, you can go online, you've got thousands of pages of resources and data and reporting and what are things trading at and who's buying and who's selling and this and that. I think the life settlement industry needs to get to that step. I think we need to get to a step where, whether it's through Lisa or you know, uh, Bad Hess at AA Partners in Zurich, are you know, we're collecting data and we're providing more data. I think we it will make it will help to make the industry more transparent. Uh, it will help for investors to get more comfortable and make larger and longer term investments if we're you know if we're talking about making longer investments if i have more data i can probably get a 20 year investment versus a 10 year investment but in the other hand mark i think it will also help the consumers understand the market better and understand that it's a real institutional market that this is not some kind of a back room boiler room you know sort of investment that this is something that you know that where analysts are tracking uh, performances where you have index data, where you have you know uh, um, uh, research reports from analysts. I think all of these things are starting to happen. We've seen it more and more with the likes of Bayat Hess and AA Partners, and to a certain extent, Lisa has it really initiated some 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 data some data reporting. Uh, but I think that we if we got more out of the industry, I think that we would be able to raise more money, and 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 capital would be even more sophisticated. Uh, I'm going to step in here because I, I can tell you I'm equally, if not more, frustrated with the lack of data that we can present. So a couple of years ago, we managed to get Lisa to answer four questions. Lisa provider members uh, on the heels of their annual reporting, they list uh, four questions about what they've bought, what was the face value, what was the surrender value, and then we could factor in a percentage over cash surrender value to somewhere equate between. Uh, 7.8 and 5.2 uh, times more. When we initially sent it out, it was like, I'm going to say 50 different data points. So that was a no, that was a non starter. Couldn't happen. Um, so this year we're doing again. I think we've included two additional questions. I'm not exactly sure what those are at the, at the moment, but, uh, and that's underway. So that's going to come out again. So that little teeny tiny, subset of data that does does you no good, maybe a little bit, is going to once again show that the consumer wins when they do their when they a successful life settlement is transacted. So they're going to show them how much more they receive. Um but what it doesn't, what it fails to address is um just how many seniors don't know uh or have access to this program. So for example, we we've always listed some statistics back one back about a decade. $112 billion of death benefit lapses are surrendered for people over the age of 65 every year. And our industry last year bought $4.5 billion. That's on top of 112. So 112 is sitting out there in cyberspace that no one ever touches, talks to, or have access to. Yes, there's some degree of that that won't qualify for a less settlement. We agree with that. But even if our market were to double overnight, how significant would that be to someone like you, as I? Well, I mean, that's... That's all that's I mean, obviously, that's very important. We always want to be able to explain how big is the market and the opportunity. Um, it is clear that the opportunity is there. I mean, you have I, I mean, that's, there's so many different data points from the, so many different things that, you know, nobody knows exactly which one to use. You know, I heard that people over the age of 65 have six trillion dollars in life insurance policy. You know, uh, some some of them say two trillion. But again, there's no central reporting mechanism. If we knew exactly, I mean, we don't have to. We, we're not looking to to break confidentiality on people's households and people's estates. But we, it would be awesome to know how much policies, how much face value, how many number, what number of policies there are on people to for us to have access to that data. Um, and and also from our industry, I mean, it would be no, it would be awesome if I knew 
the total amount of face value closed by all all transactions, the the the, the age of the insurance, the life expectancies used at closing, you know, all of that data would help me fine tune my models. And then I could go to a large, a large investor and say, look, this is why you need to give me a hundred million dollars more. Okay. Because of the fact that I'm able to provide you a model that's got a lot more direct inputs from the industry that has a lot more stability, a lot more accuracy. And, you know, and, and now, now, now sort of talking to the sellers, talking to your clients, the more money I raise, the more competition for your policies and the better price you will get. And I think that's that's one of the things that people need to realize. You, If you help us raise money, okay, uh, if you help us, if you give us more data, more transparency, whatever we can tell, use to tell the story to our investors, we're going to raise more capital. And indubitably, that's going to increase the prices we pay for policies. Perfect answer. All good. Wow, we, we're 50 minutes into this, Bill. We still got you. You still awake over there? Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I'm still awake. In fact, I, I'm going to walk away from this with two words. Uh, the first one being data, which is fascinating, and and, and 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 I can understand the need for it and and the thirst for it. The second is liquidity, and I'm fascinated by this, the, the idea of selling a life insurance policy. was tried. Someone tried to sell me a life insurance policy when I was like 20 years old. And I, the only thing I could see when they were trying to sell me this was, uh, it was they were trying to sell me a product that had no recognizable value unless I died. And it didn't make sense to me. You know, the idea that it's like I could buy life insurance now and potentially if I needed to recognize a value on it before I died, this suddenly becomes a more interesting investment product. And I think that what that benef benefits two groups of people. It benefits your industry and it benefits the people who are out there trying to sell life insurance policies because nobody wants to say, well, Mark, when you die, you'll get a million dollars. You don't care. You're dead. <laughs> so <laughs> well, it's a, it's a, I, I heard this a long time ago. I think it was John Collins that said this that the best thing that, that the life insurance companies or the life insurance industry did is convince people that they sold life insurance. They sell death insurance. We, life settlement companies, we're the ones that sell life insurance. Correct. It's absolutely correct. That's fantastic. Well said, Jose. Well yeah, said. Yeah, I, I argue that, that Jose said that that this is would be more valuable. I can sit sit in that. I I've been with an agent of mine delivering a death claim, and, and it is life insurance is a great product, and certainly in in that circumstance, it was it was unbelievably valuable to to that family. Right. But having said that. There's also a large portion of life settlement that never sees the light of day. Never. It basically is lapsed or surrendered. And we're just trying to help those folks uh, get a little more money uh, on a life insurance policy that they paid into with their hard-earned money for a long period of time. Uh, and we've got a lot of impediments in the way. One of the, one of the biggest is, is ourselves and our fear of failure. And I think we're we've been 30 years in this business. We're we're no longer afraid to fail anymore. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I don't think, nobody nobody here appears to be in a failure mode whatsoever. Yeah. Hey, Rob, Mark, if somebody is listening to this and and is intrigued and wants to have a further conversation, uh, what is the best way for them to reach out and get in touch with y'all? Sure, I'll go first. My name Mark Murky. People know they can always reach me on my cell phone at 954-326-9378. And my email is Mark M at L I settlements.com. And Rob, follow up. Uh, Rob Haney, cell phone 954-599-4433. And my email is R O B at L I settlements.com. Super fantastic. The other thing that uh, listeners can do if they're not haven't done so already is hit the follow button. That way you are then subscribed to the podcast. You don't have to worry about when or where the next episode comes out because when they drop a new episode, you'll be notified and you can listen. Uh, the other thing you could do is if you find this information interesting, useful, valuable, tell people about it. Let them know. Uh it's an, it's definitely an odd topic for a lot of folks, but it's very much an intriguing topic as well. Until next time, I am the producer, Bill Tucker, thanking you for taking the time to listen today. On behalf of Rob, Mark, and everybody in the life and se life settlement industry, thanks for taking the time to listen today. And I'm going to remind you that you can go out today and make today a great day.
or not. It's up to you. It's your choice. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time. Thank you for listening to Unlocking the Hidden Value of Your Life Insurance, the show that helps you unlock the hidden value of life insurance. Click the follow button to be notified when new episodes become available. Visit our website at www.lisettlements.com or give us a call at our office line at 866-326-5433, extension 1017. You can also directly contact Mark Murky at 954-326-9378 and Rob Haney at 954-599-4433. 